to welcome you to our inaugural session of the new NEMA Empowerment eLearning Series. We're very excited to showcase the expertise of some of our members in this series, and today we have just the topic to start a new year, thinking ahead, using complexity, sense-making, and critical thinking to better prepare for future scenarios. A couple of items before we, uh, before we start off. All participant audio is muted or will be muted, but we ask that you um, you, you practice self-muting. Um, if you have questions, uh, please post those in the chat feature and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, Glenn has said that he'll, um, he'll, he'll check that periodically throughout the session, so um, but we'll probably keep most of them to until the end. Uh, the session is being recorded and will be posted to the NEMA YouTube channel, NEMA for You, very soon. Uh, last, a short survey will be sent to you uh, via email following the session, uh, and we would appreciate your feedback. Thank you again for being with us today, and now it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenter. I could take up a good deal of time today going through Glenn Woodbury's bio, but since we only have an hour uh, or so, I'll just touch on the last two decades. Uh, Glenn is the director of the Naval Postgraduate Schools Center for Homeland Defense and Security. Prior to his appointment at NPS, he served as the director of the Emergency Management Division for the state of Washington from 1998 until 2004. During his 10 years as state director, Glenn served as the NEMA president from 2002 to 2003. Um, Glenn is an educator as well as an experienced practitioner, and we're so happy to have him with us today. Without further ado, welcome, Glenn, and I'll pass it over to you. Uh, hopefully you can see me now. It'll take me a minute to uh, adjust my slides a little bit here. Uh, while I do, I want to thank uh, Karen. This is intended to be a, a kind of a future scenarios discussion. Um, in a normal environment, we'd all be together, and I'd be showing you some videos, and we'd be talking about them extensively. Uh, we're going to do kind of a mix of that. I'm going to show you a, a series of videos um, with a little bit of discussion and, and, I guess, lecture in between, and then we'll, we'll see where this goes. Um, the videos um, were developed uh, kind of by a combination of partners. I want to do a shout out to, to FEMA, uh, to Dave Kaufman and, and CNA uh, for helping us develop uh, some of these videos. If, if you don't like some of the things that are in the videos or, or you're not pleased with them, uh, that's all my fault. So don't blame any of our partners for that. So frankly, let's just get started. What I want you to do is I want you to watch the video. Um, each video is about six minutes long. Some are a little bit shorter. Uh, some, I, some I've cut. Um, but these are images of possible, not necessarily probable features. So as you look at these, um, don't, don't think that I'm trying to advocate for any, any certain future. The idea here is to, to think about trends and drivers that are occurring today and where they might extrapolate into the future and whether we like those futures that we see. Think about um, what emerging or evolving threats are of concern for emergency management within these scenarios, uh, but also what opportunities exist. I think as you watch these, you're not going to like everything you see, but I don't think we'll have an agreement actually on, on which scenarios we like and which scenarios we don't like. I think people have different opinions, and that's perfectly okay. Um, think about the emerging management community at large, um, what you would do to influence or change a possible future. So if you see something um, that you don't like, you say that that's a point for reflection, saying, well, I hope we don't go there. Um, how do we prevent that? Or I really like that future. You know, how do we make that happen? Or whether we have any influence or not, what's the emergency management role within that future, whether we have any um, influence or not. Um, also, use your own imagination. You don't have to limit yourself to the futures I'm going to present. Um, just use the time to kind of think and imagine what might be. So let's just get started. Welcome to post-production. By that, I mean we were not able to upload all the videos we showed in the live presentation here for the recorded version. So uh, I'll give you a quick uh, overview or, or recap of the videos uh, that we intended. So here is video number one, a depiction of a possible future. The idea here is that there's a large Southern California earthquake, a large uh, catastrophic earthquake, and we're at a point in the future where technology, uh, both through data, artificial intelligence, as well as kind of kinetic technology, such as drones and large automated systems, um, have evolved to the point where they're providing great benefit in their response to a disaster. However, at the same time, uh, there are tensions uh, because decisions might be made um, that are not necessarily fully coordinated amongst the private sector and the public sector, and maybe how data is managed um, may present challenges and, and tensions in the future as well. 
So obviously you can probably think about uh, maybe the current trends and drivers that we could extrapolate that possible future from. Again, I'm not just saying that it's a probable future, um, but maybe it's plausible, or maybe there'll be variations of, of that type of future. But it's something to think about and something, if we had more time, uh, we'd dig deeper into each of these, these possible scenarios. Um, and I'll be honest with you up front, they get a little bit darker as we, as we get into the discussion. Um, first of all, how do we think about the future? Um, I, I kind of think about these, these three large categories um, as, as emergency management tries to, to look forward. Um, one is the prediction kind of category, which is where we try to get to some level of certainty of this is what will happen next, or this has the 99% chance of happening next. We're trying to, to, to lay down some certainty for our planning, our resourcing, um, and our future, um, uh, our, our, our future efforts. Um, I think we're more familiar and probably more uh, used to the forecast category, which is where you kind of look at a range of possibilities, are willing to accept change um, as, as the future unfolds. So, you know, future weather forecasts, um, um, intelligence forecasts kind of give us indications of the future, but don't lock us into any, any one path or any one certainty. Uh, the third level, I, I think that we don't use enough, um, but might be helpful for future planning and future thinking is our imagination. Uh, thinking about what are the possibilities, not just the probabilities. Uh, what might happen if we sat down and we thought, um, what could happen? Uh, what might be? Um, and not necessarily try to put any probability or uh, predictability into it, um, but just try to imagine the possibilities out there and how we would deal with them if they were to occur. So the agenda today, um, it's kind of a loose agenda. Uh, we're going to talk about, a little bit about dealing with futures um, using some different frameworks. Um, I'm going to talk about complex adaptive systems. I think, uh, uh, as maybe you've probably heard me talk before, that the world is a complex uh, adaptive place, and, and we are complex adaptive individuals and systems and organizations. I mean, all this comes together to really determine what our future is and how we, how we work within it. Uh, we'll talk about our meta trends framework. I'm going to talk about sense making, sense making being a skill, a tool. Um, a talent maybe uh, that we should be thinking more about, talking more about, maybe even teaching ourselves more about. I'll talk about some of the thinking problems that we have, um, some rethinking of, of maybe how we uh, go forward. Um, and again, the videos are, are, are meant to stimulate thought. Um, they're not necessarily any predictions or any, any kind of attempt to imply uh, that this is what I believe or what the Navy believes or what FEMA believes is going to happen. Uh, they're just there to stimulate our, our conversation. So with that, so let's look at this first framework. I, I think this is one way of you think about the future. Um, there's some past uh, in a linear way. It gets us to where we are today. Um, then there's this dotted line uh, that represents, frankly, uh, the next minute, the next hour, the next week, the next month, the next year. Um, but it's something that we don't know what will happen next, right? So, so we look at our past, it kind of comes forward to us. Uh, here we are today, and then we don't know. Um, We'd like to think we know. Um, I, you know, I was reminded this um, over the weekend as I was watching the, the various football games. Um, and in between the third and fourth quarter, uh, when we had that, that short break, I, I kind of thought to myself, you know what? Nobody in the world literally knows what will happen in this game next. In the next 15 minutes of play time, nobody knows. It is totally uncertain. The future is uncertain. So if it's so uncertain in, in sporting events, in life, um, it's certainly going to be uncertain to, to a large degree in emergency management and homeland security as we go forward. One of the challenges here, though, is we don't always agree on what our past is. Um, we have different, um, I guess, impressions, different evaluations of maybe how successful we were in the past, um, how fair we were in the past, uh, but we have often different perceptions of our own histories. Um, so that leads to different perceptions of our present as well. Um, so in, in our context, emergency management context, uh, some of us may think that we did pretty well in that event. Therefore, our preparedness today is, is pretty good going forward. And others might think, you know what? We really screwed that one up and we, we, we have a lot of work to do before we deal with the future. So our first challenge, um, at least in this linear model, of dealing with a, this linear past to present to future is that we don't necessarily agree on what the pasts are, let alone what our presents are. Often, uh, we use what I call past informed futures. Um, so looking at our various pasts um, and where we think are in the present, but there's this kind of this, this starting point where we feel pretty comfortable that today is gonna look a lot like 
yesterday, I'm sorry, tomorrow is going to look a lot like today, which looked a lot like yesterday, that there's some linearity to it um, in the near term, but then it varies as we go forward, right? There's some variation to where our futures might be, um, but generally it's following kind of this past informed future where um, what's happened in the past is generally expected to occur again with some variation. But then there's also this, this is the, this is probably more uh, realistic, the possible probable. Actually, this is my opinion. I think this is more realistic. But we really don't know what our futures are, um, that they could go off in either, um, you know, fairly likely ways or fairly unlikely ways. And there's lots of literature behind this uh, that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, I like to think of this as my waking up tomorrow morning and discover that I, that I won the Powerball, right? That this possible future up here, it exists out there, right? This, this future is out there somewhere. Um, but it's maybe more likely that it's tomorrow is going to be much like today. Um, but we don't know um, that there will be shocks to the system. There will be influences. It's a complex world. We don't know uh, what the future will bring to us. So this is a challenge as we look at planning, uh, preparedness, uh, resourcing, and strategizing uh, for the future. Um, so you know, one option is, do we focus on all the possibilities? So we look at every possibility that might happen and we write a plan. I, I call this the, uh, the Glenwood Bury uh, watch officer when I first started in emergency management. Um, we had a, when I started there, we had an SOP book, about 50 SOPs for everything, you know, every call that might come in, here's who you call, here's what you do, here's what you log. Um, but about every three weeks, we get something new, and it was the duty of the nighttime duty officer um, to write a new SOP. So by the time I left, we probably had about 180 different SOPs trying to address every possible call that might come into the, into the center. Um, so this, may, this may be inefficient, but it is, it is one avenue. Um, or should we just focus on the most probable, um, whatever we define as most probable or however we come to the conclusion that these are more probable features than others. Um, and this makes sense too, right? So if you're in an area that gets a lot of flooding or a lot of winter storms, those are the futures you might plan on um, more than events that don't occur in your jurisdiction or rarely. So this is kind of the most probable way. And, and kind of our, our doctrine and, and I guess rationalizing behind this is if we prepare for the most probable, then we can deal with the least probable um, using the same kind of systems, infrastructures, and um, uh, doctrine as well. Um, or do we focus on the worst of each? Um, this is the approach um, Bill Carwile, uh, Craig, I, I think came up with um, in, the pre in a previous administration, uh, the maximum maximums. So let's look at the worst possible, the worst pieces of each possible future and see if we have the capabilities to, to deal with them. And if not, let's build towards uh, those capabilities, uh, focusing on the worst of the worst. Um, so these are all strategies and, and they're different ways of thinking about the future um, and spending our resources and, and implementing policy, frankly. Um, but they're not necessarily consistent with each other. So some choices you would think would have to be made about how we decide which future um, models or models or doctrines we're gonna follow. So the big unknown, you know, how, do we, how do we think about that? And are we thinking correctly um, or using the right skills and talents to think about the future. Um, and this is what we'll explore a bit further. Uh, but first, another video. Once again, you're gonna watch the video. Uh, these are probable, uh, I'm sorry, these are possible, not necessarily probable features. Um, you're not gonna like everything you see, but it's okay to agree or disagree, at least in your mind. We, we, it's difficult to have this uh, obviously over Zoom, uh, but this is a good argument to have about uh, what we like about these features, what we don't like, and how we might influence them. If we can't influence them, what would be our role should these futures unfold? So this video number two uh, that we are not able to upload. Um, so I'm gonna give you a brief description of the intent of this one. Um, this idea here was that uh, emergency management becomes hyper-localized. And what we mean by that is um, services, resources, communications, um, interactions um, become much more heavily based at the local level. And it's very distributed um, across uh, communities and neighborhoods and, and jurisdictions. It's, it's basically, uh, to some extent, uh, all disasters are, are, are local, uh, taken to the full extent. So uh, obviously some of the benefits of this might be that uh, um, the community is serving itself and, and we're achieving community resiliency at, at the lowest level possible. Uh, but this also means that there's maybe a rise in uh, nonprofit groups, um, community groups, and those types of groups that don't necessarily have a defined hierarchy. So um, how do higher levels of the government like the state or federal government interact uh, with a very distributed um, uh, response and recovery network at the local level? So what the future holds in the next minute, you never know.
Um, so let's do a, 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 complete, a, a short complexity review. Um, some of you have, have attended sessions where we've talked about complexity, uh, either by myself or, or by others. Um, complexity. I think complexity is, is really kind of one of the keys um, to understanding, and maybe not understanding, but, but thinking about the future. I, I think it's one of the, the keys to, to sense making. I think it's one of the keys to um, at least having a broader mind about where we might go. Uh, so, uh, for the purposes of this discussion, what is complexity? Complexity is how patterns and order emerge from the interaction of multiple agents. And here are a couple of examples. Um, uh, the image on, on the left of your screen uh, is some metallic element um, operating a three-dimensional magnetic field. And if you didn't see the lines there, it would look pretty random and chaotic, this, this element just kind of moving around space. Uh, but you notice patterns develop, right? If you track it, it actually makes sense. Um, and it makes sense after the fact. It makes sense if you have enough kind of science and, and, and computing to say, okay, what's really happening here? And you see order emerge uh, for what looks like or would look like a random event uh, if you didn't see the, the track. Um, probably more um, important um, or relevant is the image on the right. Um, these are starlings um, um, doing what's called a, a, a murmur. Um, so they're out early in the morning or, or late at night, and, and basically they're, they're gathering and they're, they're searching for food. Uh, there's no leader uh, to, to these birds. Um, they're all acting independently uh, based upon you know, what we call simple individual rules. Uh, they're trying to find food. Um, they're trying to stay close to each other a certain distance, and they're trying not to crash into each other. And maybe they're trying to avoid predators. Um, and all these interactions, both their internal influences and external influences, produce these patterns. Um, if you watch this long enough, um, you, you start to say, you know what? If I went out uh, tomorrow morning, I'd expect to see these patterns too. So you know the patterns are going to occur um, and that there is order that comes from it. You don't know exactly what the patterns are going to be until after the fact. You don't know um, exactly the, the shapes they'll make um, and the patterns they'll make until uh, after you see it. So cause and effect is evident after the fact. Maybe you had enough science, you could piece it all together to exactly why that pattern developed based upon you know, those 10,000 birds interaction. Uh, but you also notice it's not chaotic. Uh, they're not bumping into each other. They're not flying off randomly. Uh, there is order there. Um, so internal influences, external influences, um, and patterns in order emerge. Um, we're actually used to this. Um, we see patterns in order uh, emerge uh, all the time. Uh, if you were to see, if you were to see uh, that picture in the upper left-hand corner on the morning news, and you were in, say, Louisiana. Uh, you would take action, you know, based upon the pattern that you're observing. And that pattern is an interaction of, of uh, wind, temperature, um, water temperature, um, humidity, and, and a whole bunch of other meteorological factors produce that type of pattern. And when it hits land, uh, other patterns emerge. Um, first of all, there are meteorological patterns. It's going to rain probably in Baton Rouge today. Now, you don't know exactly how much it's going to rain, but you have a pretty good idea that the future holds rain. Um, after the fact, it may be 3.12, 5.45 inches, or whatever it may be. So after the fact, you can see the evidence um, of that pattern and, and how it interacts with the environment. But there are other patterns that emerge from that type of um, uh, interaction complex system as well. Uh, people will do something. Uh, people may evacuate. Uh, people may not evacuate. People may like what government is doing in preparation for this hurricane. They may not like may not like what government is doing. And these are patterns as well. They are patterns of human behavior and, and public opinion. Um, the bottom left-hand picture, um, that's a forest. If you knew the, the right amounts of uh, humidity, uh, seeds, soil conditions uh, were present in sunlight, uh, that you would probably get a forest. After the fact, you can see where the trees grew, where the moss grew, how many insects and how many fish uh, uh, were, were in this environment. Um, but as it's occurring, you don't really know. You know that there will be patterns called trees, and there'll be patterns called fish and patterns called insects, but it's not until after the fact that you can look backwards and say, okay, that's exactly how it happened. Um, you can look at an organization. Um, that's our organization, how our organization gets funded. This is how uh, our center gets funded. You can map that out too. Um, it's not linear, it's not complicated, it's complex, right? It moves, it changes, there are internal influences and external influences um, that make this pattern work. And the pattern is called our funds. So let's take that a step further. A crisis is, or can be a complex adaptive system. 
So any crisis that's a natural disaster um, or a, I'm sorry, a natural hazard <laughs> interacting with, with uh, human infrastructure, um, it could be a, a man-made event, um, but these are interactions of people, uh, the environment, um, and our climate interacting, uh, creating patterns, right? And those patterns might be uh, flooding, um, they might be winds, they might be other things that are interacting with our infrastructure um, in our lives. So it's a complex adaptive system. I think the response to recovery to a crisis is also a complex adaptive system. How we come together with our organizations, our structures, and our relationships in response to a crisis is a complex adaptive system. We have plans going forward, and we, set, we have some, some idea of what's going to happen next and what we should do about it, um, but it really evolves over time, right? So these patterns um, during our response emerge, right? And, and order emerges, and, and we're trying to make order emerge um, during our response and our recovery. Uh, but sometimes we have good patterns, and sometimes we have bad patterns. Uh, good patterns might be that um, the public is listening uh, to our instructions, to our warnings, and, and they're doing what we ask them to do. Um, there might be some bad patterns that, that uh, um, maybe people are, are acting incorrectly um, or they're putting themselves or others in, in, in danger, uh, maybe not following evacuation orders and those types of things. But these are patterns that emerge from it. And these patterns evolve over time um, and they change. Um, at one point, people might be doing the things that we ask them to do and other times they might not. Right? And we influence that, right? We are one of the influencing factors uh, during a crisis, during the response and recovery. Um, if we show up one day and make really good decisions, uh, we are influencing the system. If we don't show up or make bad decisions when we show up, we're also influencing that system. Um, so the future is not set in stone. Um, and I, I think we know this. I mean, we go into every event, uh, we open the EOC, we put our structures and our systems and our our NIMS and, and everything in place. And then we see what comes in and then we try to, try to make the best of it. Um, and, and I mean that in a good way, right? We're, we're trying to influence this complex adaptive system called the crisis in ways uh, that lessen harm and suffering uh, to the people that we're serving. I think the world is becoming increasingly complex. And th this is one concept here uh, from Tom Friedman. He's, a, uh, he's an economist. He wrote this uh, several years ago. Um, um, but he thinks that we're in an age of acceleration, or maybe you have, have entered an age of acceleration. Um, and the three large drivers that he brings out are the interaction of technology, uh, the market, and Mother Nature. Now, he brings out the market because, well, he's an economist, so that, that's natural. Uh, but he also sees accelerating changes in complexity with each of these domains. So it's not just a matter of the interactions of these domains are complex or producing complexity. It's that it's complexity upon complexity, therefore it's accelerating. Um, for example, Mother Nature is becoming increasingly complex, interacting with technology, which makes it an accelerating drive, right? And these three domains are acting, interacting with each other. Um, I like to look at this in kind of our context of uh, the things we deal with and change maybe the market piece uh, to the human domain. Um, but there are three big domains that are interacting, making the world increasingly complex, and that's the human domain in the upper left, the technology domain, upper right, and the planetary or environmental domain uh, at, at the bottom. Again, within each of these domains, uh, the world is very complex and our interactions are complex. The technology domain is constantly evolving and changing. Uh, the planet is always changing. Um, whether it's climate change, tectonic plates, uh, the planet has been evolving for billions or trillions of years, right? Um, and our human domain is always changing and evolving, whether it's politics, religion, radicalization, uh, culturism, Whatever it is, we're also always evolving and changing in a complex way. But the interaction of these um, makes us think about the acceleration that Friedman brought up, uh, that the complexity of our world, you know, our context is also accelerating as the human domain interacts with the technology, interacts with the environmental domain. So, so where do we take this framework and apply this kind of complex environments um, idea. So we have a past, brings us to our present, and there's some future yet to be seen determined by these intersecting trends, right, in this complex world. But the thing about the influence and the trends is that small influences can change the future pretty quickly. Uh, I think of Hurricane Ian um, as it approached the west coast of Florida uh, last year. And, you know, for days, you know, Sarasota, um, Tampa Bay uh, were under threat, they're going to be underwater. Um, you know, you know, that was a good forecast. 
Um, but within hours of landfall, something changed. Something changed in the environment. In, in, in the meteorological you know, factors uh, that influence where a hurricane goes. And it wasn't Sarasota got slammed, it was Sanibel Island. So these small influences can change the future pretty quickly. And sometimes the futures change dramatically. Um, if we were here on January 5th, 2021, uh, looking at the future, uh, we may have thought about one trajectory of where we were going uh, over the next day, weeks, or year. Um, and then there were influences uh, that changed our, our future dramatically. So here's the next video. Again, watch the video. Uh, these are possible, not probable futures. You're not gonna like everything you see and it's not meant to advocate for any eventuality, but think about where emergency management um, would have to think if they were in this environment in this possible future um, and any possibilities of opportunities or influences that we might have. This is video number three, uh, a depiction of another possible future. Uh, the thread or theme here was that the current political divide or polarization uh, um, continues uh, into the future and becomes a hyperpolarization, uh, where, in, in effect, people are deciding where to live based upon the political views of that location, of that geographical location. Um, the challenges for emergency management homeland security might be um, that there's distrust uh, amongst uh, different political jurisdictions uh, based upon political views, based upon this kind of hyperpolarization, and not just uh, horizontally, but vertically as well, that uh, it may bring the question and, and you know, promote distrust of uh, jurisdictions responding in support of other jurisdictions or decisions being made about resource uh, distribution based upon uh, disparate political views as opposed to uh, other you know, rational uh, decisions and doctrine of decision making and resource distribution, uh, disaster declaration decisions, and, and things like that. So I cut that one a little bit short uh, on purpose. Uh, it just goes into a little bit deeper, uh, more tactical type of, type of issues. So, um, so some other things to think about. Um, this is a book uh, Julia Kayyem uh, recently uh, wrote. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm reading re the chat. Uh, yeah, this is a great book, thanks. <laughs> um, uh, Juliet, maybe you're watching. And, um, she, uh, she wrote this, uh, she was a former undersecretary uh, of, of Homeland Security, um, Massachusetts uh, Emergency Management and Homeland Security and, and, and many other things you probably see her on CN quite a bit. Um, she wrote this book, not necessarily for emergency managers, but kind of for the general public to understand a little bit more about where emergency management and disaster management is, is going. Um, and some of my kind of key takeaways, and, and there are many, but these, you know, these four are something to talk about. Um, she brings up the, the concept of inevitab inevitability. Um, that while we'd like to think that we're going to be stopping and preventing and mitigating all disasters, um, there's, that's not really in our future. Um, that you know, once we get done with this flood, there will be another flood. And it may be worse, um, it may be better, um, but just the inevitability of emergency management, that we'll always wake up one day, read open the EOC, and just get back to work. Um, that there's really no kind of success of, of, you know, we're completely free of risk now, that there's an inevitability to risk um, that we're just going to have to accept. Um, I, I like her concept about the safer we become, the more risks we take. And she brings up the example of um, kind of the, uh, the trends of skydiving, that when skydiving you know, first began, it was obviously very dangerous um, because there weren't a lot of uh, rules or um, um, safety features or, 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 uh, kind of constraints on, on what you could do or what you couldn't do. Uh, so we made it safer. Um, we, we put rules in place, we put safety features in place, uh, we made parachutes safer. Um, but what happened was the safer we became, the more risk we began to take. <laughs> we said, okay, well, now that I'm safe from that, I can try something different. And what they found was over time, um, we didn't necessarily reduce the numbers of deaths and injuries in skydiving by these safety measures because people would just try the next thing. Um, and think about that in, in, in kind of our context. Um, we, we make ourselves safer in order to live in more risk-prone area, right? So um, we're going to make ourselves safer by elevating our home or, or um, uh, putting in levees and so on and so forth. And then we take the next level of risk and we say, oh, well, now that I'm safer here, I'm going to build an addition to my house and add a little bit more risk. So this concept of the safer we become, the more risk we take is something to consider as well. Um, she brings up this idea of, of our role is consequence minimization. Um, and this kind of goes to the inevitability is that we're, we're never gonna necessarily win 
you know, every disaster. Um, we're just going to make uh, the costs less each time. And that's kind of our, our goal is to make the consequences that are inevitable um, um, be less harmful uh, or be less costly. And it's hard to measure or at least you know, publicize our success when there will always be a consequence. And it's hard to, to kind of measure against what didn't occur should we, had we not taken uh, preparedness measures or mitigation. So the idea of consequence minimization um, is, is something she brings out. And she talks a lot about situational awareness and sense-making as well is something that we should be thinking about going forward. Now, we've always talked about situational awareness. Um, she takes it a step further, and actually I'd like to a little bit later too, is that it's not just being aware of what's occurring, it's being aware of what's occurring, why it's occurring, where it might be going, and how we influence what we might do with where it might be going. Um, so taking situational awareness from kind of the static understanding to understanding and then action. She talks about these two books as well. well she talks about these two books in her book. <laughs> I heard this great uh, uh, comment um, at, a, at a session we did uh, in, in November. Um, if you want to write a best-selling book, um, pair a color with an animal. And, and, and then publish it and then come up with where the content is later. Um, thanks, Sean, uh, for that comment. So anyway, she brings up these, these two books as well. Um, I think we've been familiar with the black swan, um, the idea, um, uh, this metaphor that, you know, high profile, hard predictive and rare events are kind of beyond the realm of our normal preparedness and our normal expectations, uh, but they do happen, right? And so how do you prepare for the highly improbable? Um, examples that Talib brings up are 9-11, uh, uh, the financial crash um, of 2009. Um, yeah, I think I got that right. <laughs> the financial crash, um, these, these very, very large events um, that are just difficult to predict, forecast, let alone prepare for, that we still have to deal with. Um, and, and how do we go about that? Um, but she contrasts that with a book that just recently came out by Ms., uh, Michelle Booker, uh, The Gray Rhino. And the idea behind The Gray Rhino is these are the dangers that are right in front of us. They're huge. They're coming at us. Uh, and yet we don't do anything um, or we don't do enough. Um, these things are right in front of our face um, that, you know, given, you know, enough, I guess, uh, resources, um, attention, uh, political will, um, we would do something. Um, but generally we don't. Um, and, and she brings up um, uh, things like the pandemic. Um, also economic crises that, that are right on the horizon, climate change, um, these gray rhinos that are charging at us uh, that we need to act upon. And it's, it's interesting kind of play between these two concepts, the improbable, um, this unpredictable, and then the large events that are predictable and charging at us, um, but both of them are very difficult to deal with um, for, for future events. So I want to build on and Julia's idea uh, that she brings on sense making. So we've been talking about this quite a bit here at, at the center. Um, and we've had a couple of workshops trying to figure out what is sense making. Um, um, I'll, I'll go as far as say, I think it's a skill, I think it's a talent um, for future thinking. And as, as I've kind of talked and learned about this, you know, these are kind of my main components, at least so far, what I think sense making might be. Um, it includes elements of critical thinking. Um, you know, looking at questions and questioning, you know, the information and data that's coming at me and, and, and thinking critically about what people say about what's happening. Um, I think, as I've talked about before, there's this element of complex adaptive systems and understanding the complexity in the world, the complexity in crisis, the complexity uh, in our infrastructures and complexity in our organizations' relationships um, that we have to understand better um, in order to um, behave better. Um, I think there's this aspect of futurism um, and, and looking at weak signals uh, that we should think about. Uh, the weak signals being um, kind of having a discussion about what are we hearing out there that hasn't really manifested itself in large ways, but might in the future. Um, I think there are elements of pattern recognition and forecasting that we should learn about, as well as strategic foresight uh, that Dave Kaufman um, and his colleagues worked at uh, quite a bit at, at FEMA and previous administrations. Um, and I think cognitive frameworks are part of this sense-making as well, and probably some other things. Um, here's one cognitive framework uh, that we like to use, the Canadian framework, the sense-making model. Um, it's one model. I think there are other models out there that we should learn about and potentially use, um, but this is one that seems to be um, 
useful uh, amongst our students. Um, I use it quite a bit. Um, it's a different way of looking at information as it comes in and categorizing it. Maybe that's too strong a word um, into these different domains. This is a simple problem. Therefore, we do this. This is a complex problem. Therefore, we do that. Um, so it's, it's a model uh, for cognitively changing the way we think, um, not just about information and data coming into us, but how we might think about the future. So our next video, um, same instructions. Think about it. If you want to chat about it, uh, feel free. Um, let's take a look. So this is video number four, um, another depiction of a possible future. Uh, the idea behind this video was that um, it deals a lot with disinformation and misinformation and the prolifer proliferation of, of these types of things and how they might affect um, response and recovery to disasters. If there are deep fakes out there, um, information is put out that is not accurate and, and how the public responds to that and how we respond to the public responding to misinformation. Um, you all talks a bit about um, kind of what rules and regulations um, maybe we should look at as a nation um, to help, I don't know if control is the right word, but help, ma help manage how information is, is distributed and disseminated uh, to hopefully um, you know, reduce the number of misinformation, disinformation, deep fakes uh, that might be out there. Okay, again, possible, maybe not plausible, maybe not a probable future. Um, but again, the idea is to have the discussion about, so what happens uh, with this disinformation, misinformation, and, and technology taking um, kind of another leap? And, and what are the impacts? And of course, there would be positive impacts as well that we should talk about. Um, but talk about some of the, the problems I think we have with our thinking. Um, I, I think one of the problems is it, our brains don't necessarily work in ways that always benefit us. I, I guess is one way to put it. This is a great book by Kenneman, uh, Think Fast, Slow. Probably many of you have read it. Um, one of the things he brings out is, is the system one, system two thinking about how we deal with information and decision making as it comes in. And the system the idea here, uh, very briefly, is the system one thinking. It's kind of our gut reaction, our quick reaction, based upon our biases, our experiences of, of the past. You know, what's what's kind of been wired into us. Our biases and our fallacies um, um, uh, mislead us a lot, and we are heavily influenced by by biases and, and fallacies. Um, here are a few. So, so take a minute, look at some of these, and, and, and think about um, how often maybe you've succumbed to some of these, or you've seen others um, uh, in your agency. Um, interactions with people, um, you know, fall to these the biases. Um, you know, some of these, you know, the sunk cost fallacy, the, the idea that, um, you know, we put so much effort into this plan and in, into this IT system, um, you know, so much money, so much energy. And, and when we start to see that it's not going to work, you know, we have that sunk cost. So we think we have to continue and we have to make it work, uh, regardless of, you know, maybe people questioning, you know, whether we should continue and just, just maybe just drop it or not. Uh, confirmation bias. Um, we look for information that confirms what we already believe. You know, this is very true. And obviously there are now algorithms out there um, in Google and other search engines that you know, kind of um, build on this confirmation bias. Um, don't mean to single out Google, but all search engines have algorithms that give us um, basically the, you know, they feed the hunger that we're looking for. Um, all these fallacies you know, cause challenges um, in emergency management. You know, when we get into a crisis, maybe we don't think we have these biases, but I think all of us do. We all have these, these mental models of how we process information uh, that's built upon our experiences, it's built upon um, our observations, uh, built upon our prejudices, frankly. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So these biases and these fallacies you know, uh, affect how we think about the future and how we deal with, with, with making sense. So some rethink. Um, these are just some ideas and, and hopefully you have more, maybe you can put some in the chat. Uh, by the way, thanks Chris McCombs for <laughs> getting the, the full correct title for for, for Juliet's uh, previous assignment in, in Massachusetts. Um, so anyway, um, uh, I, I think as complex systems are occurring, uh, whether that's a crisis or a relationship um, or how we're working with maybe executive leaders or political leaders, maybe identifying that it's a complex system and diagramming, mapping it out. So what is happening? Um, you know, who are the main players and how are they linked together? Where are the influence points? Um, where are the points where we might intercede to, to change um, uh, the futures into positive outcomes as opposed to negative outcomes. Uh, so looking at this, looking at the world um, and, and um, our interaction with it as a complex system and saying, so what does this look like if I were to diagram this or map this out? And, and then working through that. Um, we, we, we tend to, to enjoy writing, and I guess it's just kind of our, our human history, that we, we write 
things in the English language or other languages, and it's very linear, right? It, it's hard to, to map out a, a complex you know, system uh, intelligibly um, in a tome or in a, or in a paper. Um, and think about the influence points that change the outcomes of the system. What can we do today to change you know, possible futures or probable futures? And as the futures are unfolding, where are the influence points that we might have received? Uh, this is a, a, a book, uh, Adam Grant, Think Again. Um, so he talks, again, what I mentioned before, trying to recognize your own biases and those of others you are working with. What mental models do you have? Um, I'm still just kind of trying to understand what we actually mean by mental models. Um, um, I've seen it brought out where, for example, if you're in the military, you might have you know, a way of processing information that might be different from somebody that wasn't in the military. Meaning that you know, the frameworks that you use, how you process data and information coming in, and how you make decisions of it might be different than, say, an artist uh, or a teacher. Um, or, or some other profession. And these are the mental models. I, I, I think I take that a bit further. I think our mental models also include our biases um, and our prejudices. And we may not actually understand or never kind of self-reflected on what biases we have. And, and I think sometimes they're affected by, you know, our, our experiences and our past professions, um, you know, where we grew up, how we grew up, um, um, the neighborhoods we lived in, uh, whether they're, they're, they, were, they were, you know, whatever economic level we want to think about, that we had mental models of people in different economic um, situations, and we processed you know, their experiences differently through our mental model. Um, this book also brings out a great kind of uh, uh, chapter on, on can we have more productive arguments and, and gives some, some tools and some tips um, when we're so split and so divided that there are ways that we can still talk to each other. And that's, um, that's maybe a positive way forward as well. Uh, this book, um, exercising, again, rethinking, what can we do going forward? I, I think we need to exercise our imagination you know, more purposefully and, and, and more, more often. Um, don't just think about, you know, how can we narrow down to the prediction and, and the most probable future? You know, let's imagine at least to, to generate a discussion, um, to talk about what, what might happen, uh, what might we have to deal with in the future, um, and how we want to interact with that future. Um, this book was recommended by a, a colleague, Rodrigo, I think you're out there. Um, I, I admit, I haven't read it yet. Um, it, frankly, I, I, I've read the reviews on it, Rodrigo. It's a little dark, um, but Rodrigo it, it advises that this is, should be recommended reading for, for all emergency managers. So learning how to make better sense. I think this is a tool skill uh, that maybe we should learn. Uh, maybe it should be a, a job position. And actually, I've, I've got a, that's a teaser for, I'm going to show you at the end here. Uh, but maybe this should be a job position of, of sense makers in emergency management. What does that look like? What's the background? Uh, what's, what's the curriculum for teaching sense making uh, in emergency management? I think we should be using frameworks and cognitive abilities better to understand complex situations and how to understand the future better. One last video. This is the final video, uh, another depiction of a possible future. The thread or theme behind this video was a trend of more frequent and more destructive disasters uh, continue and, and, and increase and begin to intersect. This will create uh, instability, uh, uns unsustainable costs for response and recovery. And how do we deal with that? You know, from both um, a staffing uh, perspective, a resource perspective, um, a coordination perspective, as well as you know maybe our regulations and doctrine and grants and the way we run our programs just aren't suited uh, for that type of future. And if not, so what do we start doing now uh, to prepare for that, that possibility? Okay, so um, I guess somewhat in closing, I'm gonna tie all this together. Uh, I wanna to introduce you to your new employee at the, in your emergency management agency. This is Annie, um, and she is the first emergency management sense maker, um, level one, um, because we all have, have levels in HR. Um, but um, let's look at her background. Um, she's attended all basic and foundational emergency management training. So she has a pretty good understanding of kind of the basic precepts and doctrines and practices um, that we all know in emergency management. Um, however, she's also attended newly developed training courses in sense making and emergency management situational analysis. Uh, this is through EMI, um, the National uh, Master of Preparedness Consortium and, and other uh, avenues where we, where we get our training. Um, these courses were newly developed to help kind of hone these skills and these talents. She's read every event case study, AAR, and lessons learned document available. Um, she is full of knowledge of what the past has looked like, what's worked, what hasn't worked, um, and, and, and what might work in the future. Uh, she did a six-month study at the All Hazard Center in, in Boulder, Colorado, 
um, doing a little deeper dive in, into the, you know, the current research uh, of emergency management uh, thinking. She has a certificate degree from Idaho State University uh, in complex adaptive systems and systems thinking for emergency management. So she's done a, a deep dive into this idea of understanding complexity and how it applies. Um, she's also taking some self-study courses in futurism, pattern analysis, and network social systems. Um, so that's her background, um, and that's why you hired her. What are her duties? Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, she analyzes and articulates the interactions, influences, and relationships of the entities internal and external to the agency and its mission. What does that mean? She maps out who does what to who, where the nodes are, uh, where the string, strong relationships are, where the weak links are um, in the interaction of, of your agency. So that's everything from internally, how does the planning group get along with the financial group, uh, with the HR people, um, but it's also how the agency interacts with the governor's office or the mayor's office, local jurisdictions, the private sector, nonprofits. Um, we all have plans for this, uh, but she's in a deeper analysis to, to look at where are the strong relationships, where are the weak relationships, and where are the influence points uh, to get things done. She, reads, she leads the Weak Signals Working Group on a day-to-day basis, -day, well, not a day-to-day -day basis, uh, but it's one of her regular duties. She pulls people together to just sit and talk about what might happen? What are we hearing out there that might become something bigger later on? She collects and analyzes trends and drivers that may influence the future of risk uh, for, for the jurisdiction, whether that's a state, local, or, or federal agency. Um, and she collects that you know, through data and science and her outreach back to uh, whether it's Colorado, RAND, other research groups. You know, what's happening out there? What are the trends and drivers that may change uh, our future? She maps and diagrams complex adaptive systems in place for all emergency management phases. Uh, what's the complexity of our preparedness phase, of our mitigation phase, of our response and our recovery phase? What does that look like uh, in action uh, as opposed to um, just as it's written in a plan uh, or a document? She facilitates discussions of how the future may unfold and, and she advises on strategies that may influence more positive outcomes. And she continues to collect um, knowledge of emergency management events as they're occurring to become the agency's expert on what's happening out there. What are the disaster trends? What are the lessons learned? And what are the systemic weaknesses in the profession and the dis discipline uh, across the nation, across the globe? And she brings that in all into your agency. During a disaster, she diagrams and analyzes the complex systems in play. Um, what's happening here? Who's influencing who? What's happening? And what are the possible points of influence to make for better outcomes? She leads the EOC's rapid reflection section to imagine and forecast future possibilities and surprises. Uh, so this is the group that breaks off from the kind of from the weeds of, of, of the response, um, and they think about what might happen next. What is what to, what might tomorrow bring? Um, and they come back and they brief um, the situational planning unit and the executive group on what they talked about and what they think we should be preparing for outside of the weeds of the of, of the response on an hour-to-hour -hour basis. She also monitors and advises on potential fallacies and biases that she's observing affecting decision making, especially those affecting diversity, equity, and inclusion. She's looking out um, for how people might be blinded uh, by their biases and politely advising um, on, on them and, and what she's observing. She develops and employs pattern recognition tools and assists in development of future possibilities and trends in the event. So she's constantly looking forward and using the tools, her experience, and her education to do so. So with that, what do you think about how we think and about our possible futures and how we influence them? Um, so this is, um, this is my last slide. And I just want to open it up to anybody who has any comments, um, like to, to offer any thoughts, either in the chat, or I think we can try to do that vocally. I just don't know how to uh, turn on your microphone. So either in the chat, or if you just have something to say, speak up. I guess I want to thank you for your time. Uh, thanks for spending uh, a bit of your afternoon with me. And I, I hope this was uh, productive. Thank you, Karen. Thank you so much, Glenn. I appreciate um, you sharing your expertise with us today. Um, let me share my screen here real quick. Oh, but then of course there's the, there, there. Um, Thank you again. I appreciate you you being with us today, Glenn. I know I speak for everybody when I say I, I always feel a little bit smarter after having spent some time um, with you. And uh, and thank you for sharing uh, this really interesting and cool topic with us today. 
Um, thank you. And thank you to the audience for, for being with us today. Um, you can find out more about the NEMA Empowerment e-learning series on our website um, or email me, klangdon at csg.org. Um, as a reminder, there'll be a short survey coming via email, and we would really appreciate your feedback. Um, the webinar recording will be will be available um, on the NEMA YouTube channel uh, very soon. Thank you again for attending. Take care, stay well, and have a productive rest of your day.